Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second day of the symposium. Warm welcome to those tuning in for the first time, and welcome back to those who attended yesterday's sessions as well. Uh, my remarks will be brief and uh, more in the form of a vote of thanks, because many thanks are due to many people. Um, yesterday, Jonah Siegel opened the proceedings by thanking everyone. Um, and I want to take the opportunity to thank Jonah. I want to thank him for the time, care, and support that he has given to this project. My thanks to Seth Coven for his support and for helping us think through the logistics and for the wonderful presentation yesterday. Um, deep thanks to Kuyana Butler, who's not here today, but who's been amazing. Thank you for her help. Uh, to Danielle Farah for designing the beautiful poster. Thanks to Nick Springer, who has been providing tech support behind the scenes. I know Lauren will be, you know, thanking everyone as well, but I'm not part of Rutgers. Uh, but the entire team at the Rutgers Center for British Studies has been absolutely wonderful to work with. So I'm very grateful for that. And I want to sort of register my personal thanks. Um, my thanks to the Berkeley British Studies Center um, and director Mark Bever for supporting this project from the get-go. I'm very grateful for that. My thanks to Laura Morello for following up on every detail. I'm very thankful to the center uh, for its support. I hope that this kind of institutional collaboration can be developed further so that we can use our resources to think collectively of the important questions before us. And um, also to think more about how institutions can think critically and reflectively about their own place with relation to these questions, questions of race, colonialism, land dispossession, histories of slavery. I would like to thank the panelists and roundtablers for their intellectual generosity in sharing their work with us. I have learned so much from so many of them over the years. And I am truly excited to learn from the new work and important new ideas that are being presented and coming to the forefront. I'm really grateful for this intellectual exchange. Thank you to the audience for your enthusiastic support and engagement. And last but certainly not least, my thanks to my co-organizer, Lauren Goodlett. I want to thank her for inviting me to uh, come on board with this project. Um, I admire the tremendous organizational energy that she brings to the project. It's been absolutely amazing to work with her. I am grateful for the long and rich conversations that we've had over the past year, over Zoom, phone calls, um, in conceptualizing this workshop, the symposium. And, um, you know, because, because of the pandemic, our, our academic lives has been so uh, diminished in a way. I mean, I don't know when was last time was that I saw so many of you or when I will see you again, but it's been important to foster, to sustain those nodes of intellectual exchange. And uh, I'm so grateful to have been able to do that with Lauren. So thank you all, thank you very much. And with that, I am happy to hand things over to Lauren. Uh, thank you, Sukanya. Um, it's my really great pleasure and privilege to join Sukanya in, in welcoming you to this virtual space for the second day of our symposium, How Victorianists Might Talk About Race. Um, clearly, like Sukanya and in concert with her, I owe a world of gratitude to the speakers and moderators who are joining us from several parts of the globe, 18th centuryists as well as scholars of the Victorian era and the long 19th century, researchers in fields including history, literature, art history, political theory, geography, post-colonial studies, and digital humanities. What an amazing group you are. My only regret is that I can't take each of you by the hand and squeeze it as we join our audience for a second day of intellectual ferment, hard questions, 
and urgent conversations. Let me say how truly earnest we are in inviting each of you, audience members, as well as speakers and moderators, to please share your thoughts, comments, and questions. We want to hear from you despite the limitations and asymmetries of the Zoom webinar format, which we choose for purposes of security. Please join us as well in making this a respectful and generative space where scholars across generations and disciplines, shy as well as bold, emergent as well as mature, listen to and learn from one another in a group that extends from undergraduates to emeriti. Working on this event with Seth Coven and Jonas Siegel, who co-direct the Rutgers British Study Centers has, has Center, has as always been a pleasure. They've been supportive and inspiring intellectual partners, ready to roll up their sleeves at every step of the way. As Sukanya mentioned, the RBSC team includes the indispensable work of Kiana Butler. Um, the partnership of our friends in English, including our superb chair, Meredith McGill, our friends at the Center for Cultural Analysis, including Danielle Farah, who, as Sukanya mentioned, created the poster. Many students encouraged and helped us. A special shout out to history grad student Nick Springer for his expert technical support. I also want to thank my Victorianist colleagues, including my Emeriti Victorianist colleagues and others who gave valuable advice along the way, especially Dana Luciano and Maurice Wallace. Working with Zucania, a, a fount of interdisciplinary eclat and poise the likes of which we, we all wish we had, um, has been rewarding at every level. Um, for me personally, a professional delight, a learning opportunity, and an ongoing friendship that I, I value. We at Rutgers are grateful to her as well as glad of our new partnership with Berkeley's British Studies Center. And that is not an exclusive arrangement. So, so please do uh, join us in these inter in institutional collaborations. We also thank Belinda Edmondson, our colleague at Rutgers Newark for her part in the early formation of this event. She's been doing incredible work as chair of English, as well as leader of an uh, amazing Sawyer seminar on migrants and immigrants in the American city, particularly Newark. Outside of the Rutgers Berkeley channel, we're indebted to Talia Schaffer for many good ideas and help with social media. Finally, as we open this second day, it seems important to recognize that our ability to gather through Rutgers, virtual though that assemblage may be, is possible because the campus stands on land that is part of Lenape Hoking, the traditional and unceded land of the Leni Lenape people. On behalf of myself and my co-organizers, I wish to honor their ongoing connection to this region and pay respect to all indigenous people across the diaspora. The Leni Lenape people were already mostly displaced before the university's founding in the mid 18th century, but the youth of those remaining in the area were not welcome to what was then known as Queens College and were sent to an Indian boarding school. It is likewise important to recollect that Rutgers, like so many US universities, was founded on profits, from the slave trade and in early years was constructed and supported through the labor of enslaved men, women, and children. Indeed, through the good work of Rutgers Scarlet and Black Project, we now know that Sojourner Truth was enslaved as a child by the brother of Rutgers first president. It was not until the end of the 19th century more than a hundred years after the university's founding, Thank you, that, Rutgers, that Rutgers graduated its first African-American student, James Dixon Carr. I know that the speakers, moderators, audience, and co-organizers whom I am privileged to welcome this morning 
will want to join me in acknowledging the labor and lives of these people and their descendants in the cultivating and crafting of this land and this place. To make that acknowledgement is also to task ourselves to do our part in sustaining and honoring this land, as well as critically interrogating the histories and afterlives of these events. Thank you so much. I now um, am going to offer you a, a short break before we convene the next panel at exactly 11.30. You see, I uh, Danielle, are you seeing me? Yes, we're seeing you and we're hearing you. All right. There's a strange like... echo. You... Mm. Sorry about that, Wayne. Would you like to uh log back in or i noticed i noticed he's got this you're appearing twice on my screen is there another thing open that might be the cause or one of them might need to be muted if there's two open all right i'm going to close and join again i think that's a good idea There could be a phone on that often happens and when you have two like that there's still one on there yeah he does still um nick could you please uh remove the other wayne this work this works no i see myself and it, this is fine all right w yes yeah, would you like could. to do would you like do you have a powerpoint to share i have images to share not a powerpoint but I'd okay like is there a, could we do a test on the screen share right now if nick is here and yeah, are you seeing things? Yep, yes. yes, beautiful. All right, brilliant. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, let's please convene. Thank you, audience. Um, you've been very patient. We appreciate you. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for today's panel. Uh, Daniel Hack is professor of English at the University of Michigan. He is the author of two books, The Material Interests of the Victorian Novel and Reaping Something New, African-American Transformations of Victorian Literature. He is also editor with Rachel Abloh of the journal VLC, which was recently awarded the Council of Editors of Learned Journals Phoenix Award for Editorial Achievement. Uh, Danny will be explaining uh, what the progress of his introductions 
and Q&A will be. I turn things over to him. Thank you, Lauren, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the first panel of the day. Thank you again to the organizers. Um, before I introduce our distinguished speakers, I want to remind everyone that questions can be submitted through the Q&A function. Uh, and uh, you can do that uh, while people are speaking or afterwards, and I will read them aloud when we get to the, the Q&A. So please make, make use of that. Um, okay, our first speaker, Wayne Modest, is Director of Content at the National Museum of World Culture and the Verald Museum Rotterdam in the Netherlands. He's also professor by special appointment of material culture and critical heritage studies at the Vrijja Universiteit in Amsterdam. A cultural studies scholar by training, Modest works at the intersection of material culture, memory and heritage studies with a strong focus on colonialism and its afterlives in Europe and the Caribbean. His most recent publications include the co-edited publications Matters of Belonging, Ethnographic Museums in a Changing Europe from 2019 and Victorian Jamaica, 2018. Modest has co-curated several exhibitions, most recently, What We Forget, an exhibition that challenged dominant representations of Europe that erased the role of Europe's colonial past in shaping our contemporary world. His talk today is titled, quote, I don't know what is wrong with these black people always talking about slavery, unquote, visuality and the afterlives of Victorian race discourse in Jamaica. Our second speaker, Aviva Griefel, is Edward Little Professor of English and Cinema Studies at Bowdoin College. She's, she is the author of two books, The Deceivers, Art Forgery and Identity in the 19th Century and The Racial Hand in the Victorian Imagination. She is also co-editor of Horror After 9-11, World of Fear, Cinema of Terror. Professor Briefel is currently working on a book about the material culture of Victorian spiritualism and on an edited collection on labor and the horror film. Her talk today is titled Honto's Shawl, The Fabric Production of Indigenous Ghosts. I uh, turn it over to, to you, Wayne. And you are muted. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Thank you for, for the invitation and for you know, being part of a conversation. I must admit that I feel um, strange, strange in this conversation because <laughs> I'm no longer a Victorianist, but it is um, good to, I, I still continue to think through questions of race and racism. So I'm sorry to, to the organizers for being such a terrible um, communicator. Um, I hope you can forgive me for that. The, the paper that I want to present today um, quickly, it, it um, takes up the challenge that, that was set out by you all, um, uh, by the organizers um, that prefers to sham or critical understanding of race. It continues uh, and this, this junctures between racial grammar of the 19th century and that of the present moment in ways that, as you say, we hope will enhance the critical analysis and of the manifestation of race and its abiding legacies. I want to do that in relationship to Jamaica and the work that I've been doing in relationship to any form of Victorianism really focuses much more on the emergence of museums as part of a Victorian infrastructure, an infrastructure um, out of Victorian of Victorianism and how that overlaps with, with, with questions of race. And so much of the work that I was doing and when we and Tim Barringer and I or edited that co-edited volume, Victorian Jamaica, was intended to try and think through the material and visual culture of Jamaica during the Victorian period. And my own focus was on the question of museums. Now, however, I want to turn a little bit away from that while still engaging with some of it to think through um, racial afterlives and how we contend with those Victorian notions of Victoria um, herself as a figure um, in terms of how we contend with race in the present. And to do that, I want to just quickly introduce to you a few artists' work that I've been working with and how they themselves have been trying to think through race and race thinking. 
So I start out with a quote. And if I make a funny sound, if, my, if, if, I, if I speak differently, the intention, it is intended to be so because I'm narrating what, what in Jamaica is, is, is racially signified as uh, what we call an upper St. Andrew accent. <clears throat> I don't know, she says, what is wrong with these black people. Always talking about slavery and trying to blame other people for their problems, she says. I think that they just need to move on. That's why I am happy, she says, to be a mixed breed. We mixed breeds, she says, don't have those problems. This quote is excerpt from a brief conversation that I had with a Jamaican woman in the departure lounge of the Norman Mand International Airport in Jamaica. We met while I was on my way to plan a conference on slavery and, um, uh, in, and, and its afterlives together with wonderful colleague Trista Thompson and Hugh Copeland in Chicago. Her statement was in response to my telling her where I was headed and that I would also be curating an exhibition on slavery at the Institute of Jamaica and that was several years ago. Though amazed, I was also intrigued that she thought it okay to articulate such a sentiment. Her mixed breed self-identification as opposed to these black people, which I presumed to be the category to which I belong, I'm not so sure how she would say it, placed her within the Jamaican racial identity of what, I, what, what has been called brown. Her brown, here, brown signals what may be called mixed race, biracial or Creole within other contexts, which in Jamaica, which in the Jamaican context signals a complex and not easily explicable relation between color, class, and power. Brown is not white, but it is not black either in my estimation. Brown is imagined to occupy an upper class position for to be brown in this sense at least in complexion and poor may mean that you are indeed black. Indeed, these cat this category brown has historically been associated with the upper class, well, not all the time, but has, in, has been associated with a higher class position within Jamaica. And historically, this class position also wielded power. In hearing my um, interlocutor speak, my critique speak, at the airport, I was reminded of this wonderful 1851 book by Bigelow, Jamaica in 1851, where this um, visitor to the island engaged with the racial categories that were to be seen in Jamaica at the time. And I think Bigelow, if I remember correctly, was an American, were to be seen at the time. And in a certain kind of way, was astounded by the ways in which different racial categories operated as a space for a certain kind of racializing politics. I'm interested in how that kind of sketch of race, which um, um, subtends different kinds of physical, but also class orientations in Jamaica at the time, white, non-white Jews, black Indians, not only animates and sometimes becomes occluded in our conversation around what race looks like or looked like in the 19th century, but also how that connects with contemporary understanding of race and racialized belonging in Jamaica today. I cite this incident here, therefore, not so much as an exploration of the meaning of that racial category, which I believe remains to be explored in more, much more complex detail, but to bracket the contours of an investigation that is really speculative about racial afterlives and how do we deal with that within contemporary Jamaica. Among other things I, I would like to think about is how this thinking about race subtends with other conversation about commemoration, who constitutes the Jamaican? What is at stake in the bodies that are regarded as more Jamaican or not so Jamaican? And how this racial underpinnings still fashion much of our 
material, visual, and more recently, I've been interested in the question of sonic culture and how that sonicity ties with a racial, what I, what, what in, in a recent article, I, I, I called the visual life of social suffering. So in what follows, I just want to explore a little bit of these conversations. I'm going to um, engage with a few people's work um, and primarily one artist who I think for me has be been a very important um, person, art artist to think with, Roberta Studdart um, and her work on, 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 on thinking race um, um, more, um, um, over a period of time. And I would have written about um, Studdart's work together with Tim in, in the Victoria and Jamaica publication. And I want to um, um, think about some of that in, 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 in this, in this pre presentation. So let me share a few images from Stoddart and, and, and see if we can talk to them a little bit. And please tell me, I know that I might be out of time quickly, but tell me when I'm, I'm running out. So Roberta Stoddart excavates the colonial past in the present. And while she does this, she does this by exploring the personal histories of family, of ancestry, of sexuality, and of country. And this is what we wrote in, the, in, in my previous article, and then I moved to something else. Her work, as we, were, we discussed, pushes beyond any kind of exclusionary history of national narratives that seek to exclude some people based on racial or sexual subjectivities. What Stolach demands us of, of us is a more complex engagement with what whiteness might look like, what creoleness might look like, what blackness looks like within the racial hierarchies that animate contemporary Jamaica. Much of Stoddart's work is animated by a recurring concern for how we understand the psychic work of race and racial formation in the Jamaican context. In not this one, but I'd go down first to, 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 to this one. Stoddard has long been interested in this kind of conversation. In her work, she engages with what I, working in another vein, has called pressure. The pressure that, that, that race bears down on us, on, on people in Jamaica today, as they complexly navigate what it means to be Jamaican in the contemporary condition of where, where race still plays an important role. Among other things, this pressure is animated by a complexly entangled relationship between colonialism and the material conditions in which people continue to live their lives in Jamaica today. And where colonialism continues to haunt how we understand the question of political belonging. Negotiation of racialized, gendered and class belonging then becomes a, a, an important part of our work. Um, for the last 20 years or so, or actually more than 20 years, she's been, Stoddard has been interested in, in exploring, for example, the question of homelessness and vagrancy and the vulnerability of people whose lives are threatened by a certain kind of disposability. This kind of disposability, I argue, of life as long, has a long history in Jamaica, within the Caribbean more broadly, where colonized lives were dehumanized and regarded as being less than valuable, replaceable, fungible. In her exploration of vagrancy, she not only engages with the question of, that are limited to the body, but for Stoddart, her large scale history painting, for example, here that you see, and I hope you can see it, um, called Sleepwalkers, includes um, um, Stoddard draws inspiration from writers Charlotte Bronte and Jean Rees and Michelle Criff to offer a vantage point from which to explore how the past lives of race and racialization lives on in the present as a burden, as a pressure on both the individual and on the social more broadly. 
this forms part of an ongoing exploration on her part of a kind of spiritual vagrancy, especially of the contemporary Creole white subject position within the afterlives of colonialism. This painting, in my view, po possesses a dreamlike quality alluding to the hallucinatory landscape of the European surrealist, but in a distinctively Caribbean setting with Spanish moss in the moonlight, moonlit trees. The ghostly human figures and disquieting animals confront us with their enigmatic gaze, reminding us of the psychological dimensions that is always at stake in the work that um, um, Stoddart um, gives us. The dream world that we enter invites us to consider the complex interiority of our subjects, black, brown, white, positioned before us in a 19th century conversation piece. Yet this is an interiority that is not simply about individual characters. Here Stoddard brings past and present together, revealing history's defining role in the present. This work, I, I, I argue, like her corpus more broadly, connects the individual to larger structures of social relations impacted by the colonial past, by slavery, and by the, wor um, and the world it created. It connects individual to family, family to society, all implicated in a history of racialization, all struggling to understand how race continue to pressure us in the present. As with this work, Sleepwalker, Studdard also does a similar work in her Mad Woman in the back room, which, which um, um, uh, allusions in Mad Woman is also to Charlotte Bronte's novel Jane Eyre and Jean Rees's expansion on that narrative in White Saga. So see, Sleepwalker, like Mad Woman, attunes us to how the working of a kind of racial pressure works on the, our mental health to the working, um, and but she draws this to a broader framework to think through questions of misogyny, of patriarchy, of power, and what that might mean for how race continues to contend with Jamaica today. I've been interested in just trying to tease out some of um, Sodat's work, and primarily because um, I am, I've been interested in not just the thinking around racial afterlives, which I do in another part of my work in relationship to popular music. So in a longer essay that I've written, I've been talking about how popular music articulate racial, ra racializing presents and futures using Burning Spear and Vibes Cartel and more recently, um, Coffee. But one of the things that I've turned again to is the ways in which questions of whiteness, of creoleness, um, the ways in which people like Michelle Cliff um, in her work helps us to return to a more complex or think again about how race works in Jamaica and what language we can find to describe that, which, while, which on the one hand acknowledges the hierarchies that are that continue to structure Jamaica today, which is still one where race plays a serious and important role, but still tease out the, the ways that race um, it, um, Im impacts on multiple lives in very different way. In Stoddard's work takes us on a kind of, in, in, in a kind of capricious way to think through the affective and the effects of race on social formation in Jamaica. She reminds us, I want to contend, that in our post-colonial present, which some scholars have described in memory studies as what we could call post-memory present, a long and drawn out afterlife of the colonial past continued to work, a kind of Victorianism of race and racial formation continue to work. And in this, white, black, Creole, brown, continue to structure the ways people live their lives today. But 
These are not simple categories, but complexly entangled and overlapping categories that require some more um, complex teasing out. One of the issues that I find important in this work is to try to think through, for example, how Indians, the so-called Indian from indentured Indians who came to Jamaica after 1945 have been um, part of this structure since Bigelow's um, entry in, in 1851. But what that has done to try and think through race and racial formation um, differently. And I've been trying to find artists who've been working on that. But for that, you can look at also the work of um, Anna Kessin. In closing, or I, I just want to mention one other artist whose work has been interesting me as well. And what I'm trying to do here is, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm, I'm just simply interested in trying to go back to how artists today in Jamaica, even if um, questions of race have taken on different um, 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 struggles, are still contending with it in, in their work. And one artist who's in, in, uh, I've been interested in is the artist Omari Ra. And Omari Ra, who has been part of this movement called He's, he's called African and a, form, a part of a former radical artistic movement called the African Vanguards that emerged in the early 1990s, early 2000s. Um, and they're also interested in this race as a sort of necklace, as a sort of structure that holds on to us. And in a way, um, one of the works that I was looking for, and I, I, I couldn't find an image for you today, was, was Omari Ra's um, work called folk drama. Vicky hated the sun, but she loved playing with her necklace and her scepter, where, where he also brings Victoria into the present to speak to the, quest, the kind of racial formations that are continuing to animate um, contemporary Jamaica and how, how we understand our contemporary lives. And But in doing that, he takes a, a sort of radically other position where he is very much in, in, involved in what he calls, uh, describes as empirism. So a kind of Victorian, Victorian as empirism. For Ra, empirism is a kind of irrational pathology that is the inverse of rational em, um, empirism. And it's like a hydra, he says, a kind of racial formation that continues to ensnare contemporary con uh, Caribbean in its afterlives and structures not still the relationships of power of defining Jamaica, who is Jamaican, that kind of notion, but also how black people suffer in Jamaica today. And there is this beautiful work that is now on the screen, which is uh, two massive portraits. One which um, um, painted in orange and the other in green, where what he's speaking to is the ways in which um, earlier colonial historical formations of race and, 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 and racism continue to inhabit the political space of the present. So the orange is supposed to refer to the People's National Party, and that is the party of, you could say, the more left-leaning party in Jamaica. And the green is represents the Jamaica Labour Party. And what 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 Ra does in these is in these pictures, in these in portraits, is that he makes a relationship between Taki, a long ago hero from the 1800s, and he draws that history into the present and the anti-colonial struggles that were into the present into um, to these two figures. But he suggests that this is still ensnared within our language of the political struggles that continue to, that Jamaica continues to battle with. Notions of coloniality, race, racial formation, for Ra cannot be abstracted from notion of political culture, political violence, political belonging in contemporary Jamaica today. These two artists like Laura Facey, like David Boxer, like um, 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 Nicholas Thomas or um, other contemporary Jamaican artists are artists that in this paper I'm trying to work through how they have continued 
to reckon with that 19th century racial formation that created a certain kind of hierarchies of belonging to and in Jamaica and how that continued to ensnare the current um, political landscape and the landscape of even a question of not only who belongs, but who has the right to life um, within contemporary Jamaica today. My opening foil was from a wealthy brown Jamaican who suggests a certain kind of distinction between herself and those black people. My closing is with artists who are inviting us to, on the one hand, not forget how race continue to live its life in the present, but like Roberta Studdard, inviting us to ask the question whether or not the black-white dichotomy that was a part of that Victorian, what we understood to be um, how Jamaica comes to narrate itself in the present. And even Rex Nettleford would have spoken about Africa and Europe as a certain kind of dichotomy. But whether or not that kind of simple dichotomy helps us in better able, able to describe the current ways in which race continues to work, not only in Jamaica, but in the broader Caribbean and, 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 and more broadly. One of the things that I end with is to suggest to you that even as I speak and write and think about these issues, coming from cultural studies and coming from anthropology and working in a way a lot with the visual life of sufferer suffering and how race articulates together or articulates um, in the lives of really the black poor in Jamaica. One of the profound difficulties I've had and which I'd love to open up for discussion is I am not so sure, even as I do it, how to write race when I'm thinking about race from the perspective of the elite, from the perspective of the brown, from the perspective of the that part of society which has always dominated political life in Jamaica. I don't know yet how to write that. And I would love to discuss how we write up because in a certain sense, that for me, writing that racial thing, uh, writing race um, and attending to those lives is sometimes a complexity that I don't know how to do. Thank you. So much. Um, so once we have the screen back, great. Um, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, Aviva, are you there? You are. It's all yours. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and I want to start by thanking Sukanya and Lauren for participating in this, uh, for inviting me to participate in this symposium. It's really an honor to be here. And I am really also honored to follow Professor Modest's uh, wonderful talk. And uh, given the subject of my talk and the fact that I'm coming to you from Brunswick, Maine, I also want to recognize and honor the current tribes who comprise the Wabanaki Confederacy, the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Malazit, and Mi'kmaq peoples who have stewarded the land throughout the generations. So I'm gonna share my screen and uh, can you see this thumbs up for those of you who are on screen kind of? Okay, yes, Danny, okay, excellent. Um, so um, my talk today um, is part of my current book project, which examines the ways in which Victorians used spiritualist practices to understand their everyday material culture and to think intentionally about the uncanniness of life under capitalism. My thoughts on this book were launched a while back by what may appear to be a ludicrous question. What is spectral clothing made of? 
the Santums in Victorian ghost stories and in real sightings always emerge fully clothed, and yet rarely do they explain where and how they acquired these garments. Victorian skeptics repeatedly raised the paradox of spectral clothing to undermine spiritualist belief. In his 1863 pamphlet, A Discovery Concerning Ghosts, for instance, British illustrator and satirist George Cruikshank humorously speculates about whether there are spiritual outfitting shops for the clothing who pay visits on earth, and if the ghost of a lady had to make her appearance here, she could not present herself before company without her shoes and stockings, so there must be ghosts of stockings. And this is an illustration on the right of ghosts of stockings, if you were wondering what those would look like. I explored these essays, these ideas, in an essay titled Spectral Manor, which focused on the debates about spirit clothing and in how Victorian ghost stories drew on methodologies of realist description to depict this clothing. In expanding my research for the book, I began to think about spiritualism in a transatlantic context and discovered that debates about ghost garments raised vital questions about race, spectrality, and cultural production. Today, I will present my initial findings by discussing the spiritualist performances that took place in Vermont in the mid 1870s under the guidance of the American mediums Horatio and William Eddy. Extensively covered in the British and American spiritualist press, these seances featured the apparition of Native American spirits who interacted with white audience members. The most famous of these ghosts was Honto, the spirit of a young native woman who materialized shawls and blankets. I will argue that the Eddy brothers, among other American spiritualists, use the authenticity of native craftsmanship as evidence of the legitimacy of spiritualist practice. Their public seances convey a dual process of appropriation seen in both the exploitation of indigenous performance and the adoption of racial authenticity to support the tenets of the predominantly white spiritualist movement. Before turning to these seances, let's take another look at Crickshank's pamphlet, A Discovery Concerning Ghosts, which uses the implausibility of spectral clothing to deny the possibility of ghosts altogether. Cruikshank writes that as there can be no such things as ghosts or, or spirits of clothes, why then it appears that ghosts never did appear and never can appear. In addition to underscoring the absurdity of imagining spectral places of consumption, such as spiritual outfitting shops, he asks us to think about the implausibility of spectral fabric production. If there is such a thing as spiritual material, he opines, then comes the question, from whence is this spiritual material obtained? And also, if there are spirit manufactories, spirit weavers and spinners, and spirit tanners and tan pits. If this be so, then there must, of course, be ghost tailors working with ghosts of needles, how sharp they must be, and ghosts of thread, how fine they must be, and the ghost of a sleeve board and the ghost of the iron, which the tailors use to flatten the seams called a goose. Only think of the ghost of a tailor's goose, and so on. Shank generates an increasingly technical language, exposing the labor that would be required to produce spectral clothing. His descriptive excess may remind us of Bruce Robbins' concept of the sweatshop sublime, the overwhelming realization that every one of our possessions belongs to elaborate and oppressive networks of production and power. To illustrate this concept, Robbins includes a passage from David Lodge's novel, Nice Work, from 1988, in which the protagonist finds herself contemplating the dizzying processes and systems that go into making a cup of tea, including the labor and materials required for the kettle. The digging and smelting and milling of ore or bauxite into sheets of steel or aluminum, the cutting and pressing and welding of the metal into the kettle shell, spout and handle, the assembling of parts with scores of other components, coils, screws, nuts, bolts, etc. 
For Robbins, such realizations can lead to an overwhelming sense of helplessness and even disgust at our dependence on the work of other people. But Cruikshank's enumeration of spectral labor serves a very different purpose. It is a negative process whereby listing the specialized steps and professions needed to make spirit clothes leads to the absurd imagining of these things occurring in the afterlife. This was a common move for skeptics of spiritualism who tried to materialize the requirements of producing clothing in order to dematerialize ghosts. Despite and perhaps because of attacks such as Cruikshank's, spiritualist accounts of materializations in the 1870s, which was a period when spirit materializations really took off, right, to the actual production of spirit bodies uh, in seances. So because of this, um, spiritualist accounts did not refrain from describing spectral clothing. Instead, they dwelled on the vestimentary details of the outfits worn by visiting spirits, describing them with a specificity that rivaled the rhetoric of fashion periodicals and advertisements. Note, for example, the detailed description of the spirit Florence Cook during an 1874 seance. Her dress was of light blue merino, trimmed with black velvet, fitting high up in the neck with just space enough to show a glittering necklet suspended around her throat by a band of black velvet. Her ears are pierced and she wore earrings. On her feet were ordinary spring boots. Spiritualists would sometimes ask ghosts for permission to snip off a piece of their garments for closer inspection. In a letter to the spiritualist, spiritualist journal, Medium and Daybreak, a Mrs. Fitzgerald explained that she took a sample from the dress of spirit Katie King to a well-known drapery establishment. After looking through a pile of mull and other muslins, the man said, I cannot find you an exact match as I have no doubt the pattern you have is Indian and handmade and not machine made like ours and those we send there. I said, very likely, perhaps the hem will tell you. He replied, it is not machine hemming, but what we should call Taylor's backstitch. In referencing production, these spiritualist accounts carefully balance precision and vagueness. They allude to specific fa fabrics and processes of manufacture without providing a clear production story. Did Indian ghosts weave the handmade fabric? Who was the tailor who performed the backstitch? The American spiritualist Eugene Crowell addresses such questions in his 1879 book, The Spirit World, which assures readers that spirits in the afterlife do make their own clothes and that, quote, spiritual garments are made from textile fabrics and both these and the garments are the products of spirit skill and labor. However, he never elaborates on the specific conditions or processes through which these things are produced. It seems that Marx's theory that commodities only embody abstract rather than concrete human labor also extends to the spirit world. Starting in January of 1874, the Eddy brothers held public seances in their farmhouse in Chittenden, Vermont, which promised audiences direct views of fabric production by spirits. The Eddy seances consisted of the materialization of various Native American spirits, both male and female, who interacted with and performed for their audiences in various ways by displaying supposedly authentic Native costumes and war paint, playing instruments, dancing, smoking, or making things. The Eddie brothers were among several white American mediums who beginning in the 1850s conjured native spirits. By the end of the century, many audiences became wary of such materializations. One 1892 manual, for example, advised mediums who might be less than honest, never prostitute yourself or the cause you serve by stooping to personate a dead Indian or the majority of the more intelligent spiritualists will promptly brand you as a fraud. As Molly McGarry argues, the prevalence of materialized native spirits and seances challenged the trope of the vanishing Indian, which she defines as a logic of abstention and abstraction that justified settler colonialism. 
She adds that, this is a quote again, neither wholly appropriative nor simply reformist, the history of Anglo spiritualists ambivalent affiliations with American Indians raises questions about the importance of a specifically religious worldview to the construction of secular politics, end quote. The spirits materialized in seances, such as the Eddy brothers, did not represent particularized tri tribal identities, but in Catherine Troy's words, were a synthesis of images, characteristics, and behaviors that New England and Midwestern spiritualists had come to associate with Indianness through exposure to white representations of Indians in popular and scientific media. Honcho, who you see on the right here, was according to one contemporary journalist, the prima donna of the Eddie brother seances. And a lot of the um, images of Honcho and also the descriptions of her performances, I've taken from um, Henry Alcott's book, People from the Other World, he, which he published in 1875. And Alcott was a journalist and a spiritualist, and he would go on to form the Theosophist Society with the Russian mystic Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, right? Otherwise known, known as Madame Blavatsky. So in his 1875 book, People from the Other World, which offers, again, the most detailed accounts of these seances, Henry Alcott writes that Hancho, quote, appears young, dark complexioned, of marked Indian features, lithe and springy in movement, full of fun, natural in manner, and full of inquisitiveness. Catherine Troy explains that spirit maidens like Honcho provided a human dimension to dominant white perceptions of Indians as animalistic. Honcho danced for audiences, as we see here, smoked in front of them, and I'll return to this image of her smoking, signed autographs, and allowed spectators to interact with her in various ways including by measuring her and weighing her. Everything about her presence was intended to be memorable and to confirm her reality as a native ghost, as opposed to, for instance, being one of the Eddie brothers in disguise as some skeptics suggested. So here I'm just gonna pause and say, I don't know who or what Honto was. There is no explanation. Um, beyond, you know, skeptics at the time who was like, it must have been one of the Eddie brothers in disguise. When you're dealing with questions of spiritualism, often uh, I find, you know, discussions revolve around kind of treating these phenomena as if they actually happened, even though we think in our minds they, they probably didn't. But I think there's a really interesting question to be posed about Honcho and whether if in fact, she was one of the Eddie brothers rather than say a mass hallucination or, or something else uh, about the question of racial performance and brown face. And that's something that I want to think more about as I continue this project. But for now, I'm gonna treat her as a quote unquote actual ghost, right? In the way that she's described. At the pinnacle of these performances, Honto would allegedly manufacture shawls and blankets in front of fascinated audiences. These acts of production offer an at once technical and mystical corollary to physical craftsmanship, as we see in Alcott's account of one of her performances. And I'll return to these images again. Honcho in my presence reached up to the bare white wall and pulled out a piece of gauzy fabric about 40 yards long, which parted from the plastering as with a click as if the end had been glued to it. She hung it over the railing to show us its texture and then threw it into the cabinet. At either end of the platform, she plucked as if from the air itself, knitted shawls, which she opened and shook and passed behind the curtain. Then descending the steps to the floor of the room, she pulled another from under Horatio Eddy's chair where I had seen nothing but the bare floor a moment before. This account features active verbs that loosely signify production, but which are not immediately linked to the actions needed to make a shawl. Honto reached, pulled, threw, plucked, opened, and shook. 
The passage also includes references to materials like glue and sounds like click that signify acts of making, but not those generally required in shawl making. This alternative language of production also appears in a second passage from Olcott's book. Shawl after shawl, Honto twitched from old Mrs. Cleveland's and Mr. Pritchard's feet and shoulders, astonishing them as much each time. Then she stepped to the right of the cabinet door, and this is the spiritual cabinet where spirits, from which spirits would emerge. It was like a little closet, and stood just opposite me, looking intently upon the floor by the mop board. There was nothing to be seen at first but the bare planks, but presto, as I suddenly watched, I saw a heap of something black, as it might be a piece of a woman's dress or a quantity of black netting. She stretched out her hand and daintily picked it with thumb and forefinger, and it was one of her shawls. Thus, within a few feet of my nose, exhibited the whole process of materializing fabrics and left me in a very pleased mood, as might be imagined. The pseudo-technical language of twitching, stretching, and picking appears alongside the rhetoric of magic, of things appearing out of nowhere, of presto, of astonishing. Olcott ultimately directs our attention away from this sense of the magical, which might suggest that Honto's act is mere sleight of hand by turning to assurances of eyewitnessing and truth. Within a few feet of his nose was exhibited the whole process of materializing fabrics. This sense of proof is also communicated through sensory experience as audience members are invited to see and feel the fabric. The best specimen exhibited was about a yard square and all were generally of a brown color, having a structure like silk tissue and a feeling like crepe. Olcott's illustrations reflect this mystified view of fabric production. The titles of both of these images reference acts of making while actually depicting moments of observation and display. In the first, Honto contemplates her own production, and in the other, audience members touch and observe the final product. As part of this strategy of misdirection, Olcott appends a note to this second image, the one on the right, that reads, the platform railing that was supposedly on the stage has been omitted by the artist in this and other full page pictures because of the inartistic effect of so many straight lines and the additional fact that they interfere with the view of the group. This railing is a nuisance at any rate and should be removed. Its only conceivable use, as I can see, is to deter rude spectators from rushing forward to grasp the phantoms. He draws on the promise of representational honesty to explain the artist's removal of an authentic detail from the scene. If Alcott admits to this seemingly minor omission, then every other part of this visual representation must be accurate, including the claim that this is an act of making rather than its aftermath. But for Olcott and the Eddie Brothers audiences, these images do convey acts of production, linked as these shawls are to Honcho's racial authenticity as a native spirit. Before she produces her shawls, Honcho displays herself to the public to offer a full view of her Indian costume. And this is Olcott, I have seen her with what seemed to be buckskin leggings and a short dress reaching a little below the knee. And again, with high moccasins trimmed above about the top with what looked like fur. Audience members were invited, sometimes invasively, to touch Honcho's costume and body. Somebody in the audience asked if she would allow Mrs. Cleveland, one of the white spiritualists in attendance, to feel the beating of her heart. Whereupon, Honcho opened her dress and Mrs. Cleveland laid her hand upon the bare flesh. It felt cold and moist, not like that of a living person. The breast was a woman's and the heart beat feebly, but rhythmically. The same pulsation was felt in the wrist. Honcho's hand was hard and of medium size, her fingers broad, but not stumpy, its color dark. In a word, the hand of an Indian. It is from these authentic Indian hands that Honto's shawls would emerge in ways that suggest a continuity between her body and the fabric she produced. 
Her manual acts of plucking, pulling, and twitching generate fabric that seems to come from her body itself. Quote, she would put her hands up the side of a plastered wall and the fabric would instantly be seen to come to the ends of her fingers, almost like Spider-Man creating a web, right? Her fabric productions are framed with affirmations of her native identity. The fact that these are yet another dimension of her authenticity as an Indian woman. This becomes especially apparent in Olcott's description of one evening's performance, when after materializing shawls, pieces of cloth, and white lace, Honto requests permission to smoke. And this is Olcott. I filled my own pipe and handed it to Horatio, who is one of the Eddie family members, they had a kind of extended family, who lighted it and gave it to the squad. And then we have the astonishing spectacle of a materialized spirit from the other world walking about and drawing such great whiffs from a tobacco pipe that the glowing contents of the bowl cast a ruddy glow upon her coppery features. Alas, for all our poetical fancies about vapory forms and snowy robes and shining wings and harps of gold, there stood a smoking squaw before us in feature costume and complexion, the type of her race, and with no more appearance of spirituality about her than any of the women in the room who sat there regarding her with amazement. Honto's smoking further confirms her Indianness. It is both an act that a white woman would never perform in public, and one that conveniently illuminates her coppery features and complexion. It also grants her racial authenticity that distances her from the idealized mysteries of the afterlife with its golden angels and snowy robes. A spectral squaw is little different than a flesh and blood one. This primacy placed on her racial authenticity over her spectral identity retroactively lends a reality to her productions. They too might no longer be considered spectral, but are real material artifacts. Her identity is itself a mode of material production, her indigeneity an act of making. In concluding, I want to draw to an, uh, attention, I want to turn to another aspect of Honto's performances, one that consists of unmaking the very shawls she had just produced. While the dissolution of spirit cloth was not an unusual phenomenon in British and American seances, there was something particularly striking and dramatic about Honto's dematerializations. As one witness from Utica, New York reported, on the evening in question, Honto came out as usual, materialized shawls to the number perhaps of half a dozen, then retired into the cabinet, reappeared, came to the railing, stood there a moment, and to our amazement, began to settle down to the floor and dissolve until all form of a human being disappeared, and there seemed nothing but a mass of drapery lying close to the railing. This also melted slowly away, and every vestige of, um, I guess I'm going to wrap up, sorry, <laughs> and every vestige of, um, da, 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 da. Okay, and every vestige of her was gone. In about a minute or two, she reappeared from the cabinet, smiling and seemingly as if nothing had happened. She stood again by the railing and again dissolved as before. William Eddy was not able to give a sitting the next day. This dematerialization, excuse me, reads as an act of resistance, a disappearing act that reverses the process by which the authenticity of spectral fabrics becomes legitimized through Honto's indigenous body she unleashes a domino effect. Her spectral body disappears. She rematerializes with a cryptic or defiant smile. The fabric melts away and the eddy seances are put on hold. But this account of Honto, like the others, is authored by a white spiritualist press that has already claimed control over her body and its productions. Perhaps then this image of multi-layered erasure and of the barriers to commodifying native production signals one of the fault lines of white spiritualism, the fragility of a movement that relies on spectral forms of otherness to define itself. As Sarah Soleri has long reminded us, colonial facts are vertiginous and frequently fail to cohere around the master myth that proclaims static lines of demarcation between imperial power 
and disempowered culture between colonizer and colonized. In another performance of Unmaking, Honto, or Honto written by her white observers, seems to embody this vertiginousness herself. Let me just get to the next slide here. The shawl having been held up to view for about a minute, Honto turned round and wound herself up in it, looking like a dark pillar. As she stood motionless, the shawl gradually faded away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we invite questions uh, through the Q&A function. Um, it strikes me that uh, these, these talks working with such radically different archives um, are, um, I mean, I've thought about them separately, uh, but there's some ways which they sort of, the juxtaposition is provocative. The panel, um, the panels for this conference didn't have don't have names, but I think um, despite the differences between these talks, we could come up with a one word name for this panel, uh, which would be haunting, um, as as in a way the topic of of both papers. And um, maybe as we wait for other questions to come in, um, I could uh, ask each of you to sort of take off from that thought, where um, my sense is that uh, uh, Wayne, that your paper is, is very much about the, the presence of the past, um, whereas Aviva, yours is uh, maybe about the pastness of the past, um, although um, perhaps not. Um, and, um, and, and the fragility of, of the past, as you emphasized, or, or of certain formations where Wayne, your emphasis was on the um, persistence of those uh, formations. Um, I guess I, I, I could elaborate, but why don't I just sort of stop there and ask if, I, if either of you want to say more about those dynamics? Um, I, 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 for Aviv, I would say go first and I'll come after. <laughs> Thanks. No, I'm kidding. Um, no, I was thinking a lot about spectrality um, and listening to Wayne's talk and about the whole notion of racial afterlives and racial afterlives through these amazing representations from Stoddard and these also these intertextual afterlives um, from of Bronte's representations of Bertha and then of Jamaican identity and and so I was really thinking about ghostliness and about ghostliness and representation and um, I like that idea uh, that Danny brought up of of the kind of presencing of the past in the in the present and what's really interesting in terms of linking it to I think these spiritualist performances that I'm talking about is that question of of who is this subject who is this native ghost honcho, right? Again, are we dealing with this kind of immediate um, racial kind of brown face performance, which is something that was happening in the US at the same time in many different contexts? Or are we dealing with a kind of imagining of this kind of racial return from a group that hadn't left? And that's that whole idea of the vanishing Indian and the kind of myth that native peoples had left, you know, or had disappeared from the US was, was kind of challenged in some ways by these spiritualist performances at the same way that they were reinforced by creating native ghosts. So that's what I would throw out there. Um, thank, thank you, um, Daniel. Uh, um, actually, you are, you are, on the button in that sense, because um, in another part of this, because the, the part of this is actually 60 pages, what I have. Another part of it, I also speak about the question of haunting, drawing on the work, for example, of um, Avery Garden, who works on this, this wonderful book called Ghostly Matter, and especially tying that to the question of matter. And that's actually one of the things I find fascinating about um, Aviva's work, that it is the matter of haunting and what is at stake in that the materiality as matter that haunts us in the present. And there is also the work which I find also a wonderful work in terms of spectral thinking of um, what's her name, who I've done some work with, um, Esther Pearden, um, who works on spectrality as well. So in, in, a, 
if one were to take the question of ghostly things, race becomes, and Victorian notions of race becomes these, these ghostly things that continue to haunt us in the present. And that, that is how actually some of my, the, the, the artists, that I that I think with that I'm engaged with. There is one artist, for example, Nicholas Thomas, Nicholas, Nicholas Thomas, who who has this wonderful image of um, called Black Back, where he's working. There is a wonderful a teacup on the question of sugar and what is at stake in that. But in the image, he's also alluding to that image of Gordon, who the enslaved man in the army in the U.S. who was whipped, and he he deals with that as well. So. The question of ghosts and hauntings, um, I think, does bring the two papers together. And, and I guess for me, my question, um, and a part of where this presentation comes from, is an exhibition I did in Jamaica in 2007 called Materializing Slavery. And a part of that I was asking about the haunted materialities of race in the present which is what animates my interest as well. Thank you both. Um, there are some questions now. Uh, there's um, two questions for Wayne that I'm gonna, I'll, I'll read both of them as I think that you might um, be able to sort of think about them together um, or, or, or not, and then you can choose. <laughs> um, uh, one, uh, one anonymous attendee asks, uh, says, thank you um, both for the great talks. And Wayne, I'd like to hear more about the quote, visual life of social suffering, a, a term of yours. And then the, the other um, question uh, was um, asking you to think about uh, the, that Sarah Suleri passage about the vertiginous colonial lines that shift categories as needed to maintain power. The shifting of categories as, as needed to maintain power. And, and um, Belinda was wondering how that might apply to your description of brownness versus blackness in modern Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, first, the first question, which is a lovely question, actually is, um, will come out in an article that I published recently and also engages with these artists, um, which is on my thinking around the, the relationship between the sonic and the visual. And, and I, I was trying to understand um, the ways in which sonic aesthetics have, within the context of Jamaica, um, have um, been instrumental in trying to think through black suffering in the contemporary and, and, and how that overlaps, intersects with, or separates from um, visuality and what visual life vi visuality does and in that in that in that in that paper um, one of the things I try to do there is to deal with artists who work both with the sonic and the visual as a way of attending to social suffering and social suffering I draw on Jovan um, 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 now Jovan's name Mrs. Miezes I'll come back to it and other um, thinkers who are interested in what in Jamaica is called sufferation. Sufferation is a particular condition <laughs> of black precarity. So that is the first thing. Um, um, Belinda, hi Belinda. Um, um, thank you. In a, in a, yes. And um, thank you for the question. For, for me, I understand um, where, where we're getting at in terms of how um, particular these shifting categories um, become reinscribed, becomes rearticulated, becomes sought to differently in a way to think power. And, and I mean, a simple answer to you is, is, is perhaps I was asking a similar question about how do I write this? Because one of the reasons why I asked that question is if one work, so I've worked, I worked for 14 years within the structure of museums and, and so in Jamaica. And I've, I often think through material culture and think through, for example, furniture. And one of the complex things is that once one starts to study the material traces of slavery and colonialism within contemporary Jamaica, um, the only place to find that is in the 
homes of the wealthy, very often white elite. You can find some of it in, in, in archives, but if you want an amazing, amazing, amazing um, table built by one of the few black um, recently freed enslaved person, then you'd have to go to the houses of the white, brown, wealthy to do that, right? That, so I, I, I've been struggling with how, do one, how does one write um, that narrative of struggle about belonging in Jamaica, um, realizing that we are all complexly entangled in it while also continue to write a narrative of power. And uh, uh, um, how does one attend to the, 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 the way the materiality still divides the uptown and the downtown, still divides the wealthy according to racial lines and write that while, while thinking about the fact that Jamaica is a complex place where belonging has also been mediated through an idea of out of many one people and what that might mean. So I, I personally also struggle with the, that relationship between um, thinking through how power continues to have a rationalizing dynamic, but also thinking that to understand or belonging to the world, one also has to somehow push against the racial demarcations that is sometimes so easily spoken of. My, lastly, I've been trying to work with uh, Michael Rothberg's notion of implication and implicatedness as I write that power dynamic where all of us are complexly entangled in the afterlives, even if differently so. Thank you. Um, the next question is for Viva. And um, although the question doesn't use this term, I think that idea of, of implicatedness um, is actually also what it's about. Uh, uh, anonymous attendee asks, uh, would you say in your text, Saviva, that ghostliness is about whiteness dealing with the unconscious, unconscious discomfort guilt and fear, um, for example, as per uh, Colin Diane in, in The Law is a White Dog. It's a really good question. And I have not read The Law <clears throat> is a White Dog, although um, I've read about it. But what I, you know, I think, you know, one of the debates that emerges specifically around the materialization of these native spirits is again this question of whether there is a certain kind of of guilt or certain kind of coming to consciousness uh, from American spiritualism of the genocide against native peoples of the fact that there is this erasure of their identity and that somehow the manifestation of these ghosts was a way to kind of push against that and there's a debate between that versus this idea of performance that again this is another way of of what would lead late later on to like the wild west shows and the kind of like exploitation of native identities through performance um so that's a really interesting debate and in terms of american studies specifically but what i'm also trying to think about is how that transatlantic phenomenon phenomenon plays out right because spiritualism like initially i was really thinking about british spiritualism exclusively and tracing this idea of clothing and that took me you know across the atlantic to this question of different spiritualists who were trying to prove the existence both of spirit bodies but also spirit clothing but through non-white spirits right and so I think there's also like in as much as there is this kind of manifestation of potentially guilt and response to the particular condition in the US, there's also a response to these debates about material materiality, about spirituality, about, I mean, about spirits, um, and also about um, the question of native productions. Because as one of the quotes that I included um, early in my talk was about like, oh, well, this was clearly made by uh, an Indian hand, meaning a South Asian hand, right? Like that this, this is handmade by, you know, a tailor who was Indian. This is not something that was machine made, which raises its own debates about craftsmanship and identity and non-whiteness um, overseas. So I'm, I'm really trying still to kind of piece those two together. Look at the transatlantic part. Can I, can I, can I just one little thing there? Because uh... 
in a way, I, I, thank you for your answer, but in a way, this just brings to mind another way of thinking the spirituality and the ghost, but spirituality, mm -hmm. because there is, there is also, um, in the Jamaican context, anyway, um, um, the, the, the ways in which spirits become racialized. So we have the Indian spirit, um, and I use the very, forgive me for using the very racialized category, the coolie spirit. And what the Indian spirit does within certain ritual formation and spirit practices as a powerful spirit. Um, so in a certain sense, I understand the spirit could be in the ghostly, but in a, another sense, I want to tie with what, what does spiritualize, racializing spirits also do for how we understand race differently within the complex um, negotiation of power um, in the Caribbean, colonial Caribbean. So I'd like to put that in. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, I, um, that, that last question of Eva, that, that um, questioner also did note, um, they wondered if you've seen the Netflix show Archive 81, and if not, they think you might have an article there. I'm going to watch that. More. I'm excited. I have not. So <laughs> I can finish yelling. Um, yeah. Good. Question from uh, Sam Tet for Viva. Uh, and I think this this was re is related. Uh, it seems that it is the concreteness of Honto's racial identity as opposed to her <coughs> intangibility or spectrality that quote unquote confirms her ghostliness. Could you say more about the cultural link that's being drawn on or, or relied upon here between indigenous identity and the supernatural? Yeah, now that's a great question. And that's really you know, what I'm trying to work through because in some ways what I'm trying to think through is how the authenticity or the so-called authenticity of what is essentially this kind of inauthentic identity, this constructed notion of Indianness is used to uh, lend reality to spiritualism and materiality to spiritualist bodies and spiritualist materials, right? So there are many ghosts in British seances, as I showed who are like, here, here's a piece of fabric of my clothes, you know, of my clothing, and here, look how specific these clothes are, etc. But I think it's really interesting that it is when race comes into the discussion, specifically in this in these seances by the Eddie brothers and thinking about native identity, uh, indigenous identity within an American context, it's like, look, this racial authenticity sometimes somehow, excuse me, proves the ghostliness, proves the reality of what we're seeing. And so I think this goes a little bit with what Wayne was also just saying, like that there's somehow this conflation then between racial identity and spectrality um, and that they both become mutually constitutive, but in ways that's also being co-opted, like, or again, not also, but that is being co-opted by the spiritualist press to say, you know, these ghosts are real, look, because they're so Indian, they're so native, so they must be real. And so I'm trying to look at the different levels of that kind of exchange. That's a really good question. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. A um, uh, question for Wayne from Sophia uh, Joachim. Uh, the first image you showed by Roberta Stoddard uh, visually reminded me rather uncomfortably of some of the current Victorian period drama, especially Bridgerton. Uh, I, um, I wonder whether these two very different and differently motivated ways of engaging with the Victorians can be made to talk to each other in productive ways. Um, um, the only thing I can answer that is to say, I'm sure it can. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd love to talk to you about how that could be. So, so perhaps if, if I try to rewrite this chapter, then I would love to be able to include that because one of the, uh, one of the things that you probably do here is to demand so, so in, the, in the earlier part of this project, there is a lot more of talking about um, Victorian notions of race in, in the UK itself, right? So I'm also bringing together what was happening 
outside of Jamaica with Jamaica. And there's one part, for example, where I was talking about exhibitionary formations and great exhibitions that I'm talking about, a massive exhibition that happened in Jamaica in 1891, but that there is always a, a racializing language with that exhibition in relationship to, um, to the US and Haiti. So, and how people were narrating their own relationship to that. But in this chapter, I am actually very much Jamaica centric. And perhaps one of the things you are inviting me to do is not to be so Jamaica centric, but, but rather to still en engage with the articulation between Jamaica and other places, and also between the conventionally understood archive and the popular archive of coloniality. In this paper, I do not tie to film, but I tie to a lot of popular music. So I do music and, and visual culture and not film in that sense. But thank you for the question. I'm sure it can, I'd love to try. Thank you. Um, uh, Jonah Siegel, uh, Jonah, are you there? It, it seems like the question that you were raising um, piggybacks on this one neatly. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. Yes, exactly. Uh, it, um, thank you both for these really fascinating talks. It, it, I was I was particularly intrigued uh, by uh, by Wayne Modest's um, focus on Jamaica and the way that I mean your work is so international. And and and, and I'm not trying to drive you to always be doing the same thing, but I, I would like a, 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 to invite you to give us a, a, a moment more of reflection on on the interplay between. Um, between the, uh, the, the the broad international scope of, of of your work and this very local one, or or more, it, it seemed related to me to the methodological question you asked about how to uh, how to how to um, think about race from the perspective of the elite. So another kind of uh, incongruous uh, element would be how do how do how how are you thinking about um, Sorry, I'm looking for what I, I actually wrote it down in a, in a we can't, <laughs> I'm trying to find my original formulation. Uh, basically, the, the way that the that these Jamaican artists are using the international phenomenon of, of, of imperial practices and imperial tropes and Queen Victoria and, 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 and the uh, Jane Eyre and so on, how they're using these international things to talk about local issues or, or and that was yeah. a really tantalizing part of your project. You, you keep, and I, you, I think you got one other question about this, like how, what are we learning about Jamaica uh, from this international work, and 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 uh, so it's partly an invitation for you to think yeah. more about how you reconcile the two things, but also how you see these these specific projects that are engaging this global phenomena in a local context. So either one of those would be great to hear more of. All right, um, but it's actually interesting to um, to go back to what I was trying to do with this project because, in a funny way. One of the things that I, I was trying to do is to stop speaking about Jamaica from the perspective of England. I, I was actually trying to speak about questions of race, questions of Victorianism from Jamaica, so that we could suggest that people who are Victorianists and Victorian studies expert could actually think more through Jamaica to understand Victoria, rather than through Victoria to understand Jamaica. So, so that was the aim of my project in a way to suggest that if one were to start with Jamaica, then we might see other things about race. We might see other things about class and racial, um, so racial capitalism, if you want to call it that. So it, it was in that frame. So one of the other parts of my project, for example, as I said to you, um, Jamaica being the small country that it is, but as loud as ever, you know, it, it needs to tell itself how great it is. Jamaica had its own great colonial exhibition in 1891. Now, if, 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 if 1850 started a colonial exhibition in London and Paris had its and whatever, and Jamaica had its own in 1851, my intention was to suggest that for one to understand the workings of the great exhibitions, one might have to start in Jamaica mm -hmm. and not in the UK. For one, for one to understand how that mediates race. And in that earlier project, one of the things I was doing, for example, and I was battling with this wonderful scholar, love his work, Tony Bennett, who writes about the, what he calls the exhibitionary complex. And he writes about um, London and Australia and whatever. And I was saying to him, if there is a complex of exhibitionary technologies that take race as a starting point that emerges within the mid 20th century, I mean, um, 19th century, and that's exhibitions, one cannot understand that until one looks at the spectacular 
presentation of the racialized bodies that were a part of slavery's economy. That is the starting point for how we need to think exhibitionary because that spectacle of blackness as it is put on sticks is also an exhibitionary technique that also must um, think, demand that we think um, exhibitions differently. So in that sense, my project is totally otherwise. I am more interested to decentralize the UK by using Jamaica as a lens through which to understand what, how these racial technologies emerged. So that was my project. No, I, I want to say that that's totally what you did. So I want to hear more about Jamaica. That's the, that's the... <laughs> well, you, I'll, I'll send this to you sometime. You can't hear about that. <laughs> uh, we are out of time. Uh, there are more questions, uh, uh, which is always a good thing. Some of them, I think, um, ended up being addressed to some extent. Um, so hopefully people won't be too disappointed. Um, the next session begins at 1.30 uh, at the same link. And um, let me again thank our speakers for this really, um, really wonderful generative panel. Um, and uh, I think we're all looking forward to uh, more this afternoon.